Hello, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. My name is Roger Gifford, and I work with SEB in London. So I'm therefore conscious, working as I have done for many years in Scandinavia, that Nordic corporates are generally well ahead of their other country peers in terms of their thinking about sustainability. The political environment, the social environment, the weather, combined with the carbon tax levels applied there, mean that Nordic corporates are better prepared for a future which sees an, an increased demand for sustainable business practice in its broader sense. So why is this discussion therefore even relevant for Nordic companies? Well, firstly, trade routes and product sourcing are coming under increasing focus as biodiversity loss rises, almost as quickly, I would say, as concern about climate and carbon has done in the last decade. Secondly, the technology revolution we're in has profound impacts for all companies going forwards. And thirdly, investors are demanding greater disclosure and that now familiar acronym ESG is on the rise. In each of these, we need to recognize that whilst we have a global challenge, solutions like regulations will be local, applied by national governments to individual companies and consumer retail. So let's start with biodiversity. Here in the UK, we will soon see a formal review of the economics of biodiversity carried out by Professor Partha Dasgupta of Cambridge University. And this sets out a systematic formal framework for an economics that reflects that we and our economies are embedded in the biosphere. The review's framework understands and addresses biodiversity loss as an asset management challenge. Because nature is an asset on which our economies, our livelihoods and our well-being all ultimately rely. Yet that asset is being seriously mismanaged globally to the extent that our demands on nature far exceed its capacity to supply on a sustainable basis. Biodiversity is the variety of life in all its forms. And the activities of organisms are often hidden from view, but they enable ecosystems to function and provide the many services on which we rely. At the root of this problem lies what can be called the greatest institutional failure the world has ever seen. Overextraction and pollution deplete stocks of natural capital in quality, in quantity, or in both, and they affect the abiotic environment. This decreases the ability of ecosystems to provide many services, including those that regulate ecosystem processes. And over the past 70 years, there have been profound losses in biodiversity across continents and biomes and dramatic changes in the biosphere. Continuing down our current path will endanger the prosperity of current and future generations. So by changing how we think about and how we apply economics to recognize that our economies are embedded within nature, not external to it, we can take a different path where humanity's engagements with nature are truly sustainable. So equipped with this understanding, a bit technical I know, it is possible to change our approach to make decisions which are truly sustainable. Ecosystems are assets just as produced and human capital are assets. Conserving and restoring our natural assets will sustain and enhance their supply. So biodiversity is an essential characteristic of nature and a key determinant of the productivity, the resilience and the adaptability of ecosystems in providing us with services. How do we measure this? How do we bring this into our daily business decisions? But reducing our demands will require us not only to improve the efficiency with which we consume and produce and manage our waste, but also to transition towards fair and sustainable consumption and production patterns and supporting efforts to accelerate demographic transition, the movement of peoples. So there are three conclusions coming from this study. Firstly, that nature needs to enter economic and finance decision making in the same way that energy, buildings, machines, roads and skills do. And to do this requires us to change our measures of success. Secondly, it's becoming clear that it is less costly to conserve nature than to restore it once it's damaged or degraded, all other things being equal. So there is a strong economic rationale for quantity restrictions being a better policy choice than pricing mechanisms, adding taxes. And thirdly, enabling change will require collective, sustained action to transform the systems that underpin our engagements with nature, the way that we source, the way that we mine, the way that we produce. Above all, our institutions and our financial education systems need modifying. This needs governments to take action, which will have consequences for all of us in business, not least the way we trade and the way we carry out our business. 
Secondly, this is a technical story because the climate crisis is a technical failure. Many countries, especially in Asia, not just China, have grown rapidly post Second World War, encouraged by us all, and especially in the past 50 to 60 years, and clean energy has failed to keep up with those ambitions. Nuclear power has failed to deliver, and renewables have only recently come on the scene. In fact, the only viable energy source for national aspiration around the globe has been fossil until very recently. And we've all benefited economically from it. Let's not beat around the bush. Which makes developing the technology of renewables and their potential very relevant. And they're showing clear growth patterns identical to those seen in earlier product revolutions. And the natural question comes, how we get them embedded into the system as quickly as possible. New energy technologies are now seen to be superior to incumbent fossil fuel technologies. So even in the absence of a climate reason, one can argue that markets would be driving the rapid expansion of these technologies and pushing down prices at the same time. It's already happening. In solar, in wind, battery coming, hydrogen, ammonia, much worked on against fossil and carbon intensive fuel sources. Nowhere is this better seen than in Scandinavia, which has over the last 30 years totally changed its domestic energy profile from individual gas boilers to district and community heating and ground source heating. We need to do the same in the UK with our 26 million gas boilers, something the Green Finance Institute, which I also work with, is looking at closely alongside government. For comparison, consider for a moment the IT revolution, which all of us have seen pretty much within our own lifetimes. It started about 60 years ago, but only really got going in the 90s. Typically, product revolutions take a 30-year incubation period, followed by a 30-year period of disruption, followed by another 30 years of stabilization. The first 30 years of incubation see the technology developed a little bit below the radar until cost or efficiency parity is reached. Product revolutions often start with a sort of killer application, inspiring followers and inspiring creative engineers. Think of the Carnegie Steelworks of 1875, the Ford Model T in 1914, the IBM computer, personal computer of 1981, and the Tesla Model S of 2012. Incubation is followed by a period of exploding volumes, unit price declines, and soaring profits for the new monopolies. Apple is now worth more than the whole of the FTSE 100. Mind blowing. Then there is usually a period of stabilization, which sees greatly increased regulation to make sure that the gains are passed on to customers and the traditional excesses of capitalist innovation are tempered and taxed. I suggest we're just entering that third period with IT. With renewable energy, we're approaching the second phase of disruption with the usual business and political challenges that that encompasses. Interestingly, the major oil companies, not least BP and Shell, they understand this. And like Austed, they're turning themselves over time into renewable, low carbon energy companies. But the key is this, for an investor, investing capital, buying into better technologies on a falling cost curve and embedding these factors in your business model this has always been a driver of long-term competitive advantage. That is how we will bring sustainability through capital allocation and returns on that capital. Capitalism, your pension and mine. This was the case of chips and processors with mass production technologies, the first wave of electrification, even cars and steam engines. Similar story, similar timeline. Don't we wish, we wish we'd all bought shares in Amazon and Apple in their early days? or that our grandfathers had bought strongly into Henry Ford motor cars and tractors 100 years ago, when many people said they would never replace the horse. It simply wouldn't be economical. They argued then that swathes of existing industry, not least the farriers, the leather sellers, the carriage makers and the wheelwrights would all be put out of business. Sounds familiar. In the context of this tech revolution, consider human nature and the need for strong political frameworks to contain and direct the natural exuberance and excess of the creative process, of the human desire to grow and thrive to do better, alongside the natural human fear of insecurity and deprivation. These impulses can be harnessed and managed, not ignored and hoped away or squashed. I, I don't believe that communities, societies, people, set out to be bad in their determination to grow, but they can be misguided. Indeed, the history of capitalism is one of creative, exuberant growth and poverty reduction and wealth improvement. It's also a history of exploitation. 
slavery, piracy, cheap labor, extracted fossil fuel resources and deforestation resulting in biodiversity loss, just a few of the ways mankind has exploited for commercial gain. What will our grandchildren say of our exploitation of natural resources? Actually, I wonder what our great-grandchildren will say of data mining and AI and the exploitation of personal information. That's another seminar. So whilst the growth of renewable energy is impressive, all the scientific evidence suggests it's not fast enough and that we need to move much faster to halt a climate crisis before it's too late. As a result, there is a powerful social incentive for societies and companies to speed up the transition process and politicians know this. The environment movement has moved crucially from the environmentalists to business and commerce and finance and politics. Here in the UK, there is in fact an advanced policy framework to support the political will that's needed to affect change. We have the 2008 Climate Change Act and we have a net zero target by 2050. And the picture is complex. The carbon used in the delivery to your table of a South African strawberry in January can be less than that of a Dutch one from across the channel or up the coast due to the free sun and energy in South Africa versus the flight to carbon. It's a complex picture. Thirdly, ESG. ESG comes in many forms from physical climate risk, well known to the insurance companies, not in the past so much to banks who have a shorter time horizon. Physical climate risk through to political and transition risk and for equities, reputational risk. No one thought of auto companies as climate risk stocks until governments decided diesel engines weren't the future. And if the UK introduces a 70 pound carbon tax, who does that hit? What does that do to their cash flow and their credit risk? And how do we take that into account? Extra costs for some big carbon users, not so much for others. Institutional investors have embraced the ESG agenda and not just because they think it sounds good. And by the way, investor appetite for green finance has increased dramatically during this COVID period. The story for ESG is only growing, not diminishing. It's a bit obvious to point out how badly brown stocks have done over the last few months, meaning a better performance of ESG portfolios, which avoid oil companies, it's in fact a much longer trend than just the last few months. It really is the case that healthy looking ESG portfolios are good for your returns as well. And with government pressure building, adding to social concerns on plastics and biodiversity in the oceans, thank you, David Attenborough, and the feeling that COVID virus is somehow related to this, it's a perfect storm for the environmental agenda. Last year, the UK government set up the Green Finance Institute, which recognizes that the finance sector can only unlock the funding for the, this transformation if it, it works together with governments, academia, regulators, business, and the nonprofit sector. Solutions must be practical and they must be commercially viable. They must be profitable. Indeed, as is often said, it is only through collaboration that we can hope to solve our global challenges. And to this end, and from its unique position sitting at the nexus of the public and private sectors, the GFI has in the past year harnessed the expertise of broad groups of stakeholders, leading outcome-focused coalitions, supporting external working groups and initiatives, and using its platform to educate and inform. Look it up on the website, it's a great read. Its approach is to be ruthlessly practical and grounded in urgency, not least because we see green as an opportunity, not a subsidy. So what does all this mean for companies? Firstly, like the Bank of England, which is due to hold its st stress tests for UK banks next year, climate stress tests, which has been delayed a little bit because of the epidemic, I think many other regulators will follow. That means banks will need more information from their corporate clients on environmental and sustainability issues in order to be prepared for that stress test challenge. No doubt this process will take time to mature, but good to be ready for it. Secondly, ESG strategies and managed funds are only getting more demanding. Being accused of greenwashing is not good for a company's share price and therefore not good for any investment portfolio. And that means that investors will, in fact they already are, asking for more clarity on the environmental strategies of the companies they buy. Greater disclosure, greater awareness. And it's good to be ready for that too. Thirdly, supply chain integrity is already a hot topic and I can only see it rising up the treasury agenda, as we discussed earlier around biodiversity loss. Several institutions I know, including SEB, are working to develop solutions to help our customers manage their supply chains in a better way. 
and clearly some industry standardization will be helpful in gaining traction here. But in this day of internet transparency, there is no hiding place for a company that thinks it's doing good, yet has a supply issue to hide, including perhaps especially in developing countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America, where so many resources and products are sourced. So in conclusion, I believe there is now a widespread recognition that the pathways to human prosperity are the same as the pathways to net zero. And a newly optimistic narrative for green finance is increasingly coming to the fore. One that focuses on creating new green jobs, and rebuilding communities through investing in sustainable infrastructure, clean technology, resilient supply chains, and healthy ecosystems. Our role as a finance community is to devise the ways to overcome the specific barriers to investment within each sector of the economy to channel big capital towards small local solutions that will help both drive a recovery and mitigate possible environmental catastrophe. Now more than ever, we need examples of what can work. Financial solutions that generate good risk-adjusted returns and investable policy pathways that are also informed by finance. And we need the definitions, the data, and the analysis that support financial innovation, all focused on deploying capital where it is needed in the real economy. So good luck, GTR Nordics. Have a great conference.